All right, it's one o'clock. Let's get this party started. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to be talking about um, coffee and how you can reward yourself for, for being in the industry. Um, I'm Maggie Crowley, Head of Strategic Development here at Layton. We are a tax consulting firm. And joining me today is my colleague, Ibrahim. I'll let him introduce himself. Nice to meet you guys. Looking forward to talking about this. I am one of the consultants here at Layton. Um, I started off actually doing one of the products that we're talking about today, research and development tax credit. And now I manage uh, one of the other products that we have here at the company. Um, coffee is, like for most people, something that they enjoy quite a bit. But over the past three years, gotten really deep really far down the rabbit hole, um, just as part of a hobby. Um, and then we started getting into this in, in terms of the work that we do. So really looking forward to this conversation. Well, thanks, Ibrahim. And thank you for being here today. Ibrahim is a wealth of knowledge, um, very smart guy, has his PhD. So he will certainly be able to get into the weeds on um, our topic. So the plan is to first discuss a little bit about R&D in coffee. And R&D stands for research and development. And then we'll go over the types of tax benefits to available to the industry. And then we'll talk about how you can benefit. And if you guys would like to join in, ask a question, please do so. You're able to unmute and chime in, or you can also pop it in the chat box. I think at this point, everyone knows how to use Zoom. So. I, um, I'll spare you guys from giving instructions on how to actually pop a question in the chat, but we are um, happy to have this be more interactive so people can get the most out of it. So don't be shy, pop your questions in there. Um, so <clears throat> what is this R&D tax credit that we're talking about? Um, the R&D tax credit is, it's a government incentive that is intended to help businesses further grow um, and sustain their ability to, to create a new business or, or grow an existing business. And the, the term and the name research and development, you don't know, you necessarily, you don't always think of like the coffee industry. You probably are thinking of someone in a white lab coat doing research um, that's, you know, very black and white, or maybe you're thinking Apple, Google, they're doing research. And that initially when the credit was introduced in the 1980s, that is who was taking advantage of the credit because it was intended for larger, bigger businesses that were doing something that hadn't been done in an industry before. But in the 80s, the credit got a makeover and that makeover allowed it to be available to industry, all industries and companies of all sizes, regardless of age um, and what they're doing. So as long as a business is creating something new, improving upon an existing process or technique, there are likely qualifying elements for the R&D tax credit. So our recommendation as tax experts is to always take a second look and see if you can qualify for this because it can really be a significant uh, benefit to a business to help them, them grow. What it does is it offsets your income tax liability if you haven't ever taken advantage of this tax credit before, you can do a look back by three years and reclaim that cash. So often, if you've not taken a look at the R&D tax credit, you can get a significant amount, significant amount of cash because you've essentially overpaid on your, your tax, your income tax liability. And then moving forward, you can claim this credit each year if you are doing those qualified activities year over year. So this really can be implemented as a true tax strategy. And that's exactly what the government intends it for, um, to help businesses sustain their growth and continue to create and improve upon new and existing products and techniques. And this is available to multiple industries, but today we're talking coffee. So I'll hand it over to Ibrahim to explain where the R&D is within the coffee industry, because it's not just for um, those who are drinking it or brewing it, but it's for everyone along the whole supply chain. 
Yeah, so to Maggie's point, what she said earlier on what you typically associate R&D with, in my past life, uh, I was a scientist, literally white lab coat on the bench, Bunsen burner, cells growing, et cetera. Um, and that's typically what you would, what I would associate R&D with. But at least with the way the government identifies it, it's way broader than that. And it's much more inclusive. And the reason behind that is every industry is really innovating. They're pushing boundaries. They're trying to optimize in their processes. For some, it's groundbreaking in the industry. For others, it's making their individual business perform and work better. So what I break it down here just to get the, get the thoughts churning is just in each of the different, or in a few of the different areas in the life cycle of a coffee bean, uh, where can we find some R&D? What are some examples of R&D? So if we just look at the bean itself, uh, and when you come to like roasting a bean, for example, uh, you might be experimenting with different parameters uh, temperature, roast time, uh, to try and get a specific result out of the bean. Um, maybe when you were cupping it, when you're testing it at the, at the growers, at the farms, uh, you got a certain taste profile. And now you go back home to your, uh, to your roaster, to your shop, and you're trying to replicate that, or you're trying to improve upon the sweetness of it or improve upon the acidity in, that the bean produces. And you're experimenting, and that's really what you are doing, you're experimenting with the parameters to get a result that you want. Uh, Similar thing, you're researching how you how to get to a desired roast or flavor profile, um, and then when you're doing that in like your test batches, and they need to upscale and do that for your full batch roast, making sure that process is is optimized and the result that you're getting is what you tested in the the smaller batch. All of that is something that we've qualified and has been qualified, has been used in R&D in basically all of the food industry and other industries as well. Uh, these are all aspects that end up qualifying as R&D. If we go away from just the bean itself and the actual product and look at factors that just influence the production of the company and production of the work that you're doing, supply chain, how you are packaging your beans in a way that is quicker, is faster. Time is money. If you're taking five minutes to bag a coffee bean, I don't imagine it takes five minutes, but say it's taking you five minutes, scale that up on how many you're making in a day, or how many you're bagging in a day or whatnot. If you cut that down to three minutes, you're saving a significant amount of time and all the processes that you're doing to implement that that also gets considered as R&D. Same thing, when you're seeing how to seal the bag, how to preserve the coffee beans so they last longer. Roast, uh, between roast time and usage time, uh, that influences the taste of the coffee bean quite significantly. And if you're selling it and you're marketing it to have a certain taste profile, but the client gets it two months later and the flavor has, changes, has changed significantly, then that's a poor customer experience. So even in that area where you're working, you're modifying the packaging, you're modifying how you seal it, how you, uh, how you package the, the end product, all of that is considered R&D. And uh, I'm just talking about one aspect of the supply chain. When you get the green beans, how you store them, where you store them, different ways that you're testing and you're experimenting with to get better results and longevity with your product, uh, all of that is stuff that can be considered as R and I was at the, we were at the expo, the, a few of the team here, uh, what was it, two weeks ago now? And literally you walk around and it's, everyone is building, whether it's a new, uh, a new espresso machine, a new way of making cold brew, a new, this one-stop shop, bean to cup, uh, new roasters, just building new equipment. All of that engineering that is made to develop a product big or small, if you're trying to make a different type of V60 uh, to get a specific type of uh, taste, profile, taste profile in it, or an addition that you put to the air, that you put on the AeroPress to get more of an espresso type of result than the typical AeroPress. All of that development of a new product, that is also things that are considered R&D. 
Um, and then you go into the supplies and equipment, uh, same thing. A lot of the processes that will go there, I, I know in, in the US we have uh, mainly it's Hawaii and California that grow, that actually grow coffee, but there's a lot that happens in that area and in that industry and in that work that really is R&D. And agriculture is a huge area where we look into it and we've been working with companies in this area um, to really optimize and really expand how much they can claim in this area. Then going on to the next slide, really breaking it down. So give a few examples on things that will qualify as R&D in the coffee industry as a whole. How do we break it down into some principles? And there's really four things that we would look at. First, first question that you can ask yourself, am I creating something new for my business or improving upon something that already exists? Whether it's a product, a process, a technique, uh, or a formula, uh, even software. I mean, with a lot of, the, with a lot of the, the new machinery, the new equipment that we have coming out, uh, software becomes a huge component. Uh, if you're improving upon one that already exists or creating a new one, that's a, that's a first check. That's a great first check to have. The next part, and this is really kind of narrowing down the scope. If you look at new, new processes or improve the or processes that you're improving upon, the scale is really big. And now we want to narrow it down a little bit. And that is something that is technological in nature. So something that is rooted in the hard sciences, whether it's engineering, uh, the actual sciences, chemistry, or what have you, we want to narrow it down then into that category. category. And then two other aspects to also kind of ask the question uh, to see if maybe there really is R&D here. Are you testing out different parameters, different procedures this way or that way? Is there a question that you're trying to answer and trying to resolve? How do I get to this flavor profile? How do I get my machine to be more accurate and reproducible? Et cetera. And you're going through that process, what's called the process of experimentation. These are the underlying principles to then say, I am doing R&D, or I'm really likely to do R&D. Those would be the underlying principles uh, that we look at. And then for anybody that is, if you guys are trying to decide whether, am I actually doing R&D or not? Ask these questions and see if, uh, see what comes up. And then going on to the next slide is really like Maggie was saying, how does, how does this turn into a financial benefit for me as a company? Uh, we can talk about R&D day and night. I'm a PhD. I love, I love science. I love experimenting. And I love it for its own sake. But as a business, uh, show me the money, right? So with the R&D, there's a few cost categories that we can then include in the whole calculation of things that are related to the work that's being done. This is the salaries of everyone that's involved, whether you're doing the work, you're helping the people that are doing the work, or you are supervising those individuals. So we take their wages and the percent of time that they spend doing the R&D work, that's what we'll include. We can also include contractors or 1099s in that, in that category. And then any raw materials, any supplies that are used and consumed in the process, that's also a cost category that we would include in it. Things that are depreciable, whether it's a roaster, a machine, or what have you, we can't include those. And then the last item, we include this here just for completeness. Um, we don't see it too often, but some companies are really developing a software or a program um, using AI, using cloud computing, uh, then that's something that we'd also look at. And in the end, once you have all the buckets, all the items into the bucket, you get 10% back. And that's the, that dollar amount that you would see. Now, the next item to go into is kind of going back to where the R&D uh, would actually be. And taking it, instead of specific examples, what are some areas that we can look at? Uh, when it comes to the bean itself, when it comes to growing, processing it, roasting, how to grind it, grind setting, um, and different parameters when it comes to brewing, each of these will have different amounts of time that you'll spend in R&D 
but these are all these are all areas that can and we've seen including r d within it when it comes to building equipment building a roaster or improving upon the roaster that you have the grinders types of brewers in supply chain whether it's how you package it how you store it how you transport it to try and keep the longevity or increase the longevity of the product of the beans these are the areas that we often find r d in and then when it comes to supplies or equipment if you're making a new type of a new type of cup and this is really like taking it a step back we're really broadening the area of things that are, is not coffee itself but are associated items um, ways the different brewing aids uh, weber came out with their new porta filter which looks absolutely fantastic I don't know if I necessarily have the budget to buy it. 4000 is a bit steep for me. Um, but creating different aids, whether it's a funnel that you're creating that works for different, uh, different types of porta filters or how to distribute your, your coffee grinds, creating these products is also an area of R&D. Now, the conversation so far uh, has really just been about what is R&D in the coffee industry. And in this next slide, I want to go into some other benefits, other tax benefits that we really see a lot of companies, especially in the coffee industry, uh, being able to qualify for. And this is the employee retention credit. Uh, this is a credit that came under the CARES Act that is really meant to benefit companies that struggled in COVID. Whether you had a forced shutdown from the a government mandated shutdown, whether it's fully or partially reduced hours, uh, reduced capacity, uh, or you just saw a decrease, a significant decrease in your gross receipts, in your revenue. These are all areas that can then allow you to qualify for this employee retention credit. So personally, this is currently the product that I manage uh, because it's, it's a huge opportunity I personally love it because the companies that are benefiting from it are ones that really need it. And what makes this one special versus the R&D tax credit or some of the others, the R&D tax credit is it's a tax credit. It's not refundable. If you pay taxes when you shouldn't have, that's refundable. But then anything extra, anything beyond that amount is carried forward into future years to be used. The employee retention credit is 100% refundable. So say you get $100,000 in, in, in tax credit you know, for the employer, through the employee retention credit, but you've only paid $10,000 in payroll taxes. The rest of the $900,000 comes back as a check. And it's not just carried forward to be used in future years or as a future benefit, it is an immediate benefit. This is really unprecedented in US tax law. There's nothing else that we have in our tax system that is a refundable credit like this. And you see why. If a company is struggling with COVID and they've had a hard time, they need money now and not in the future, this is really the way to go. And it's like, we are glad that this is the case because then better companies can really benefit from it immediately or in the near future, in the short term. Um, but simple questions to ask yourself whether this is something that is good for you or not. If you experienced uh, any government shutdown, partially or fully, whether it was you or your supplier had a shutdown so that you couldn't get the materials to operate your business, um, or you experienced a significant decline in gross receipts, this is for 2020 and then 2021. Another item I would add that is not on the slide here, if you got a PPP loan in 2021, then there's like a 90% likelihood that you qualify for this credit. And the amount that you can get just to put a dollar value to it, the maximum in 2020 that you can get per employee is $26,000. The maximum you can get in 2020 per employee is 5,000. Um, so the numbers really start to add up and they can add up very quickly. Uh, so it really becomes a huge benefit and it's something that uh, I'm really glad that it's here because it becomes a huge benefit for the clients that I'm able to work with. I think what uh, is important to also know about the employee retention credit is that 
the salaries included can't be double dipped for the research and development tax credit. So if you're thinking about claiming both, it makes sense to do that with one with one company, hopefully Leighton. Um, but it it is you have to make sure you're not double dipping. Otherwise, in future years, that could be an issue. Um, so we can certainly help to determine which salary is better used for which credit to to give you the the most benefit possible. Another question that often comes up with the employee retention credit is, well, what if I got a PPP loan? I mean, that was the benefit the company that the government gave me. I don't have to pay that back if it gets forgiven. So, am I should I really be claiming another type of tax benefit for this? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the government has put this in place so you can benefit from it. You can't double dip. So the wages that you paid using the PPP loans, you can't use those same wages to calculate the credit. But anything that's outside of that, you're entirely allowed to. And this is why the government put this in place. PPP loans weren't necessarily enough for most companies. It helped a lot, but it wasn't enough. And this is something to really add that benefit. And you can say, well, why? As a, as, as a country, as a government, if all of our if all of our companies, all of our if companies start to close down and aren't be able to provide services, aren't be able to employ employ individuals, their our entire economy starts to sink, which we saw happening in 2020. The entire economy starts to sink, you know, businesses close down, and that's not good for anyone. So for the government to give this money back to employ back to employers and to businesses to stay afloat and to keep people employed, then it's a win-win. Absolutely. Um, another product that we support and can offer is sales and use tax. So a theme you might be picking up on throughout this presentation is that some of these tax, these tax credits are pretty confusing. And it's the same thing with sales and use tax. There are several different rules based on what you're selling, what state you're selling something in, and we can help to identify what you should be charging as far as your sales and use. And then also we can do something called a reverse audit on overpaid taxes. And this can yield an actual, another refund and benefit to you. There are several areas in which vendors are charging the incorrect tax rate for products, not on purpose, but Tax rates change really frequently and it's extremely hard to keep up with. So we'll do an audit and it's more like forensic accounting and identify any overpayment. Um, and that would be on, again, any, any purchases you're making from vendors. And it's something as small as coffee cups to like major equipment. Um, so they, of course, will vary in price, but things add up. Um, and then we can also assist you in getting back to uh, if you have been negligent in paying any taxes in particular states, we can help you get to a, a good place and minimize the risk that you have for, um, for those tax payments in future years. Let's say you haven't paid something and paid tax in a particular state for 20 years, we can minimize that to a three-year time frame. Um, so again, all these tax credits are relatively uh, confusing, complex, but we've got the team on staff here to simplify this. Um, and I did just want to note in our chat box, we do have the ability to book a meeting. If you want to speak further on any of these credits or if you have to, to run, we know everybody's time is super valuable. Um, you can click that link and book time with one of our, our consultants. So you might be wondering again with the the theme of of things being confusing here in this in the tax industry, which credits are going to be right for me? Um, so we've created this slide here to help you understand which ones would be right for you. Coffee growers will be eligible for the R and D tax credit, ERC and sales and use advisement. Coffee roasters would be eligible for the R&D tax credit, ERC, and sales and use. Cafes, 
should certainly take advantage of ERC, but if you are a roaster and a cafe, you would be able to take advantage of all three. And then developers and creators will be able to take advantage of the R&D tax credit and sales and use tax. Um, so this slide helps depict why someone would wanna choose a specialist when going down the avenue of making sure you're taking, you're taking advantage of all the tax credits that are available to you as a business. And um, I mean, it is certainly confusing and you wanna know what's right for your business. You want to make sure that you are claiming and you're maximizing the, the full scope of what you can truly really claim. And that's exactly what we do. We've got the right people on staff like Ibrahim who would, is able to filter through the raw data and understand the projects at a far more detailed level than someone with just a financial background would. And Eves has spent so much time here at Leighton actually you know, filtering through raw data on several different types of industries. So um, one thing we actually, uh, jump in real quick, Maggie. Uh, one thing on this that we really try and do is minimize the amount of work that you have to do. So for example, if we're doing an R&D uh, study with you, and then you want to see if there's potential for sales and use tax, the documents that we require for the R&D will oftentimes be a good indication whether it is worthwhile to look for sales and use tax or not. And we know what to look for. We know what to filter for. Um, because we've done it, we've done it often enough. So we we minimize the workload that you have to do, uh, and really try and find what is there and if it's actually useful for you or not. And that's one thing that we I like to pride my work in, and my colleagues in the same way. Uh, if it's something that's not useful for you, we're not going to try and get you to do it. Like that's not we don't like to operate that way. <laughs> Personally, I don't like it when people do it to me. So. I don't like doing that to any of my clients, or anybody that I'm working with. Uh, but that's one of the things that we were able to do because we do it you know, frequently enough, because we do it so much. Thank you. Um, another way in which we, it behooves you to, to use a specialist is to keep up to date with the ever-changing code. Uh, there were just changes this year that were made to the R&D tax legislation, there are weekly changes to sales and use tax, and it's our job to stay on top of that. Um, and then, you know, most of all, as I said before, we want to be able to maximize your benefit, make sure you're doing it correctly, and that you're, you're claiming as much as possible. Uh, we also support any tax calculation that we do, we support it through audit, if that happens. Audits are a part of life, but it's, it's, a lot better to go into it proactively rather than react to an audit because no one wants to deal with the, the IRS in that regard. Um, and finally, just a little bit about who we are. We are Layton. We have about um, 34 offices across the globe. And here in the United States, we have one in Boston and San Francisco. And um, we've We've been doing this for about 24 years. Throughout the business, our, our core product is the research and development tax credit. And then we specialize in other credits depending on the country we're in, the country we are in and, and what makes sense for, um, for that country. So one thing I, I feel so proud of that Leighton did while during COVID, we were able to source 1.5 billion in tax credits to help our clients get through COVID. I mean, it was such an uncertain time. The, the ability to actually still get a tax credit put a lot of business owners in a more comfortable place as we faced that, um, that time. So these tax credits are really intended to help businesses. And that is what we want to do, help you guys. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute or type one in the chat box. And if not, we certainly look forward to speaking with you and hopefully helping you claim some valuable tax credits.
All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ibrahim. Thank you for your time and your knowledge. And thank you, Maggie. of course, and we will look forward to talking again. Looking forward to speaking with you guys. Thank you for joining. Bye. Thanks.